Welcome back after the break. Um, just before we went for our break, we were looking at um, child likeness, being childlike in our kingdom thinking, in our kingdom, in the, uh, the way that we behave. Okay, and we said we shouldn't confuse it to being child childish. Okay, because childish and childlike are two different things. Okay, a, a childish is more like you know you're saying, hey. That's mine, that belongs to me, that is for me, it's all about me, okay? So even sometimes when we are thinking, I have to be up on the stage, I have to be doing everything, I have to be getting the recognition, uh, I have my name has to be called out, I have to be uh, appreciated, it's being childish, it's behaving childish, all about I, me, myself, okay? So being... Childish and childlike are two different things, okay? Um, and uh, Jesus is saying you need to be childlike but not childish. Not always thinking about yourself, not uh, uh, getting the recognition, not just being on stage, not, uh, you know, everybody talking about you, appreciating you, but you need to come to a place where you are totally trusting God, okay, totally dependent on him okay so what is being uh childlike childlike means completely trusting totally and utterly dependent on god okay because a child totally trusts and is totally and completely dependent and utterly dependent on its uh, parents a child a, a three-month-old child or a one-year-old child is not going to ask their mom mom did you put salt in the food did you cook the food enough? Is it rightly cooked, or it is is the is it still uncooked? Did you do my laundry today? Did you clean my uh, uh, room? Did you fold my clothes? Did you iron my clothes? You know, or tomorrow I'm going to school. Is my dress ready? You know, a a child does not ask its mother or its parents anything. It just basically trusts the parents totally, abandoning themselves to the trust and the care of their. Uh, parents. So the same way when we are childlike, we come to a place we are totally dependent on God for every in every area of our life, even in our very uh, daily needs, we're totally dependent on God. Where you're saying, God, without you, I am nothing. Okay. Or without you, I cannot do anything. That is being childlike, total trust and total dependence okay so in the kingdom of god being childlike is of great value okay now uh, there are other things that jesus thought about in the way that we need to think as kingdom citizens or the kingdom of god or the kingdom of heaven uh, in matthew chapter 19 verse 14 jesus said let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of heaven so he says these are the kind of people i want in my kingdom I want childlike people, people who are totally trust me and totally depend upon me. Okay. And then this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 15, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. So he's saying, hey, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, if you want to experience the king things in the kingdom of God, you got to receive it like a child so even if you want to experience and receive things in the kingdom of god you have to have childlike faith and dependence meaning that there is there'll be a lot of things that god says and does that you can't figure out that you can't reason with your mind okay you just have to receive it as a child okay you just have to receive it as a child that's why faith plays a bigger part in our walk with God, in our thinking, in the way God thinks about us. That qualifies us to enter and experience the things in the kingdom of heaven. So, you know, God tells you, go and tell this person this, this, this. Okay. And many times we have not gone and told them why, because we think, what if it is wrong? What if it's not right? What if it's uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not that person. I've not heard from God. It's my own imagination. 
Okay, it's happened to me so many times when I have missed when God has told me, go and tell this person this, 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 and I've not done. And later on, I've seen and I've regretted it. But now I have learned to step out by faith and just say what God is asking me to say, even though I can't, you know, reason in my mind, even though it might look foolish, even though it might not come true at that at that point of time, but may come true later on, the person can think uh, back and say, oh, this person said this, you know, God has already prepared me for this, but just be willing to go and say, that is faith. God is saying, hey, go and pray for that person. And, you know, that person is going through the sickness and they're saying, God, that person looks so healthy. How can you say that person has the sickness or, you know, how can I go and pray for that person? What will that person think? What if it's wrong? What if it's somebody else? We have all of these doubts and you know, and then we don't go and pray, we miss the opportunity. Or it might be somebody like um, God is, you know, some great man of God or some preacher or your pastor and your God is saying, go and tell him this. You say, pastor, you want me to go and tell him this. And you you, you hold back, you avoid, you don't do that. You know, um, I, I remember I once God was telling me to go and tell a pastor that, you know, um, just this word I got was Tom. You know, uh, Jesus in the storm and he stills the storm and says, be still. Okay. And God is telling me, go and tell him. And I say, God, how can I just go tell him storm? What what does it mean? And God is saying, go, I'll, you know, I'll just open your mouth and words will come. And I was so scared and I was thinking whether it is, whether it is that, that pastor or whether it's a worship leader standing next to him and worshiping because it's ministry time. And I didn't go and say it. And just, I think, three days after that, that pastor faced a big storm in his life. And I was regretting it, you know. Uh, saying that if I had gone and just told that pastor, God would have released words from my mouth. God would have told him what's the storm that is coming. He would have prayed. He would have got it. And it would have not come to such an extent where the, the pastor himself was going to lose his life. And that's when, you know, I took things very, very seriously. Okay. So don't be afraid, even if it is if it's a, a big man of God and you're someone who's very small and sign insignificant, just go and tell it, even though it might sound foolish to you. Just do what God is asking you to um, do. Okay, so that is stepping out. That is experiencing. That is doing what God wants you to do in um, faith. So we need to make this part of our thinking. There are times when God speaks will speak to you, challenge you, and tell you to do things that is way beyond your thinking what you have even um, imagined for your life. I never thought I will go to Bible college. I never thought I will be in full-time ministry. That is not what I uh, desired for my life. That's not what I thought about. So when God told me, I put it off. But, you know, I eventually got to the to the place where God wanted me to be and God has been faithful. So sometimes God will ask us to do things which will uh, challenge our thinking, our understanding, go against what we have thought and envisioned and planned for our life. But is respect of that, we just do what God is asking us to do. And sometimes what God is asking us to do will just not fit our thinking. And then you need to remind yourself, being part of the kingdom of heaven, you know, um, we need to be childlike. We just need to take that step of faith. Just simply trust him and totally depend on the uh, king. Okay. Now think about another important thing in the kingdom of God about being a servant in order to be great. Okay. So like all good mothers, the mother of James and John had dreams for her son. So one day she went to Jesus and she wanted to secure their places for them in the kingdom of heaven. Like all good mothers thinking about their sons and their future. Okay, so let's read uh, Matthew chapter 20 verses 20 to 26. Can somebody read that please? Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. 
So he said to them, you will, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those who, for whom it is prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased, the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So James and um, John's mother had just one request, to, uh, and they, she came with that one request to Jesus. So what was her request? That when Jesus sets up his kingdom, James should sit on his, one should sit on the right and one should sit on the left. Okay. So he says, she says, this is my only request. I don't have any other requests. And what does Jesus say? Huh? Ask the father and not me. Huh? What about the mother? <laughs> What about the mother? Mm. <laughs> the mother is uh, not concerned about herself. That is mother's love. Only concerned about the children. Selfless. That prince will not be able to understand. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, what does Jesus say? Can you drink the cup that I drink? What is this cup he's talking about? The cup of suffering, the sub cup of taking on the sins of the world, okay, paying the ransom price for the sins of the world. And what do they say? Yes. yes. Very, you know, very confidently. They don't even know what's the cup. They didn't even ask what's the cup. If they had learned about the cup, they would have run away from Jesus. And then they said, of course, we can drink the cup of suffering and we we can partake of it you know yeah we can we can do that and jesus says of course you can drink the cup of suffering and you can partake in it okay uh, but to sit on my right and on my left is not for me to decide okay but then jesus says let me deal with the root of the issue let me deal with the root of the matter so he says what you're looking for is Authority, position, or greatness of power in the kingdom. And he says, you think that by sitting on my right hand and on my left, you are going to have greatness in the kingdom, but it's not so. Okay? Because that is how the world thinks. Okay? He said, look at the, you know, in the world, you know, we can exercise authority, you know, we can uh, exercise over authority over others. We can lord it over others. We can boss over others. But in the kingdom of God, how do you exercise authority? If you want to be great, if you want to exercise authority, then you, you become the least. And you, if you want to become a leader, you got to be a servant. Okay? So you become a leader, you become great, not by exercising authority or bossing or just sitting down there and commanding others but you yourself go and do it okay so he says this is the culture of the kingdom that i belong to and this is in in this kingdom culture and when it comes to kingdom thinking you think like this if you want to be great in god's kingdom you must be willing to become the least if you want to become a leader you must become a servant that means what Willing to serve people, not lord it over them. Willing to do it yourself. Set an example yourself, just like Jesus did. And that is the kingdom of God. So Jesus says, when you become least of all, you become greatest in the kingdom of God. And that is kingdom thinking. Now, how wonderful it will be if all of us in our churches did this. You know, The question we need to ask is, are we willing to be a servant? Are we willing to be least? You know, somebody, what is the meaning of least? Last? 
insignificant, be nothing, actually being have no no recognition, no attention, being a no significance, so to speak. Now, would would we like to have a heart like that? where we'll be insignificant, where we will not have the attention, where we will do everything, but still, even if you're not recognized, we will not feel bad. We will just come back again and serve again and do it. Do we have that kind of an attitude? So that is the kind of attitude, that is the kind of heart that Jesus wants us to have. See, Jesus himself modeled that. Jesus being the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Son of God, what did he do? He washed his disciples' feet. Okay, he served. Okay, he came to serve and not to be served. Okay, so whatever you do, you know, whether you're someone up on stage, whether you're someone sitting down there, whatever you do, do it with the heart of a servant. Do it not that you get recognition, that you get praises, that you are appreciated, that people will applaud you. When you do it in the heart of a servant, you are a true leader in the kingdom but if you do it with a heart that is saying you know i don't care if i'm insignificant then you're preparing yourself for greatness in the kingdom of heaven but if you're doing it with a heart that says you know what i want that position i want to be recognized i you know you're being disqualified for greatness and leadership in the kingdom of god and that is a totally different way of looking at things and that is kingdom thinking and many people leave the church because they have been serving but they have not been recognized and they have been serving in some group in some um, position uh, in some way in the church and then if they are not made leaders of that group or they have not they're not brought into a place of position and recognition they feel very very offended and they leave that group they stop serving they even leave the church and they go church hopping from one place to an other the same way even in christian organizations the same way even with the uh, people in christian ministry in christian leadership pastors you know if they don't get the um, appointment for the church they're looking for the position that they're looking for they just want to leave and go Okay. They're not looking at it as saying, hey, whatever, whether I'm giving position, whether I'm given a title, uh, whether I'm given a card which says my name with all my degrees, whether I'm given an office or not, whether I'm treated nicely or not, whether I'm recognized or not, that does not bother me. I am just going to serve in God's kingdom. I'm going to be faithful where God has planted me, where God wants me to be, what God wants me to do. If God wants me to, God wants to take me out of here, then I will move. If God does not want me, I will stay here and serve him just the way he wants me to do without looking for titles, positions and recognition. So we need to come to that place where we humble ourselves, you know, with that heart attitude, with that kind of a heart, with that kind of an um, attitude. So are we willing to say, God, I'm willing to be least in your kingdom? You know, uh, I'm willing to be a servant so that I can be a true leader. Uh, whatever I do, God, wherever you call me, whatever is my role, whatever is my function, I'm going to do it with a heart that serves you, that loves you, that honors you, and do it in a way that glorifies your name. And I'm willing to be insignificant because that is the doorway for greatness and leadership in God's kingdom. Okay? Now, the next point is uh, the, about kingdom thinking, how Jesus taught us is to celebrate the king's perspective. Celebrating the king's perspective. Okay. So let's uh, look at this parable. Jesus gave us many parables about the kingdom of God. And here is one of those parables he gave, uh, gives us in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. Okay. Uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to uh, 28. We'll read that. No, sorry, 1 to 16. Can somebody read that, please? Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. Can you read it from this book so everyone can follow, please? Son, thank you. For the kingdom of heaven is like a, land, a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. 
And he went out about the third hour and saw the others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing, standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those who, uh, who those came, who were hired, who were hired in about the eleventh hour, they were each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Do you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give this last man the same as to you. It is not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things. Or is your eyes evil? Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. Okay. So what about kingdom thinking is Jesus talking about here? Some answers, please. What about kingdom thinking is Jesus talking about here? So when we, uh, this is like, uh, I, I think I mean, uh, this is about the last days when we have uh, run the marathon and we have reached the end, each of us will receive the same, same like as eternal life. No one will be put higher or lower. We'll all receive the same reward as the other. Even though some people may have worked much uh, harder uh, harder than me, uh, harder than us, or uh, maybe uh, uh, even though I work less than them, all teach the same because we're both equally, we both worked in order to, to reach eternal life and for the kingdom of God. Okay, thank you, Sean. Anyone else? What does this parable mean regarding kingdom thinking? Okay, God is a rewarder. He decides what rewards we get. We just have to be faithful. It's his wish what he wants to give us. It's not like giving everyone an equal thing. It's his wish. Okay, it's his wish. Okay. Like uh, we should not have the thoughts of comparison that I did this much and he did this much, but why you treated us the same? We should not have that kind of uh, mindset. Thing. Okay, not have that kind of mindset and thinking and attitude. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, you can take an example within the apostles themselves. You see, there some uh, were taken when uh, who were fishermen who were uh, taken to be apostles. And James was a tax collector. Now you see both of them, they're at both different levels. But when they come under God, they're both on the same level. That is what God is trying to show us or tell us. Okay, thank you. He's not happy, okay? That's what you said, don't compare. Okay. Jealous, he was feeling bad, okay? So, okay, so this is a parable that Jesus is talking about kingdom thinking i'm just going to paraphrase it you know just this landowner he had a big vineyard so he goes at nine o'clock to the market and he looks at some laborers and he asked them are you ready to work and they said yes so he says go to my vineyard and work i'll pay you one denarius and they were willing and they went so then he comes he needed more laborers so he comes back to the market at 10 o'clock he finds more laborers and he says hey do you want to work in my vineyard they're looking for work they said yes he says go work in my vineyard and i'll give you one denarius okay then he looks at uh, by 12 o'clock he he feels that he needs more laborers so they can finish the work more faster so he goes back to the marketplace and he looks and he finds more laborers and he asks them if they're looking for a job and they're willing so he sends them to work in his vineyard okay and then he also thinks okay let's speed up the process we can get more win uh, laborers so he goes back to the marketplace say by three o'clock and then probably at four o'clock as well to get more laborers so three o'clock he goes four o'clock he gets more laborers and gets them into his vineyard okay now at six o'clock 
the bell rings and they all have to stop working and they go back home and they all come to get their daily wages. And uh, so the owner of the vineyard tells his manager, pay the, the ones who came in at four o'clock first, then those who came at three, then who came at 12, then who came at 10 and who came at 9 a.m. And he says, pay them all the same, pay them one denarius. So all those who got um, came, you know, last at four o'clock, they got one denarius. And they were, must have been very happy just working for two hours. They went away happy. Those who were working at from three o'clock, just worked three hours, they got one denarius. Those who came in at 12 o'clock also got one denarius, 10 o'clock, one denarius, nine o'clock, they got one denarius. And what do you think people, the laborers who worked at nine and 10, what do you think they would have felt? They felt very bad. They would have felt cheated. And they were very, very unhappy. Then they raised up their hand. The union raised up their hand. And they said, you know, uh, this is very unfair. OK? Um, you know, you can't give us the same thing like you've given people who paid at 4 o'clock. OK? Uh, this is very, very unfair. Okay, and they protested. What you're doing is unfair. How can we get the same wages? And what does the land over, o, owner tell them? Yes. What did I agree to give you? One denarius. What did you receive? One denarius. So didn't I keep my word? Yes. Did I cheat you? No. Then he says, if I choose to do something else with others, then don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money or what I want to choose or what I think is right. Don't I have the right to do it? Okay. And what is your obvious answer? Yes. Okay. And Jesus said, in the kingdom of God, it is like this. But does it happen in our world today like this? No. If you uh, look at regular laborers, as I've seen in uh, many construction workers, whoever works hard, whoever does more work will be paid more, and whoever doesn't uh, work much will be paid less. Yeah, you work according to the number of hours you are yeah. paid. You work for one month, you will get one month's salary. Work for half a month, you get half a month's salary. Okay, so that is right, that is ethical, that is how it works in our world today. Okay, we will never do something like this landowner has done okay but jesus says this is how it is in the kingdom of heaven so what's the point the point is this that god has the right to do as he pleases okay what's the point here god has the right to do as he pleases and what should you and i do we just have to celebrate whatever he does yes ma'am when we compare to this worldly things and spiritual things how can we compare these two things like see if we tell normally, like in world and all, like uh, I, I can, it's it's my wish to give to him. If he worked for one hour also, I'll give thousand rupees. If you are working from the morning also, it's thousand rupees. Hmm. So what if I tell that how it will be? It won't be good right in the world. Yeah, you are not going according to wage policy. That person can sue you and uh, that person can take you to court, right? But in the kingdom of God, what, what are we saying? Jesus is, God is saying, I can do what I please and you have to celebrate what I'm doing. I'll give you some examples so you will understand what Jesus is basically trying to say. Tell one thing, Mama, yes. this. like, see, uh, we worked hard, like we, I mean, there is a gift for us. I mean, result for us when we go, when we go into heaven. Like we work so hard, like we saved so many souls. And one of the person just got saved. Is it? Is it? I mean, is it the same? Will will be rewarded with? Yes. So good question. The actually the reward is not when is we all have eternal life. Whether we I have uh, accepted Christ twenty five years back, fifty years back, and somebody on their deathbed. Just hardly one minute, like the 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 thief next to Jesus. Jesus said, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." Okay, all of us will receive eternal life. But in the millennium kingdom, okay, we will all be rewarded according to the work that we have 
done. So how faithful you have been, how much hard you work with that servant attitude, with the right attitude, with the heart that is just willing to do what God wants you to do, greater will be your position in the millennium kingdom. You will be like a one officer. That will be different. But in the kingdom of God in heaven, we don't need officers there. God is, we all what we're doing, we're just praising God 24-7. Right? All of us are singing, no need for worship leaders as well. No need for who's the best worship leader. All of us just sing. But in the millennium kingdom, based on how faithful you have been, that will be your reward. So you'll have a uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, the first level officers, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those who have not done anything much, but they have been faithful in little, little things will get grade 10, you know, the lower things like that. Okay. But there is a reward system, yes, even in the millennium kingdom. But in this context, what we are let me give you an example so you can understand why what God is saying that you know you need you um he does as he pleases, and we need to celebrate what he's doing. I'll give you some example. Now, you say you've been a believer for 25 years, and uh, you know, you're praying to God for something desperately, okay? And you're fasting and you're praying, and you waited for 25 years, and you fasted and prayed for 40 days. Finally, you get the answer, okay? Now, there is another brother called Joe, comes to church. You know, and he's hardly been a believer for just say three or four months. Say he's not even completed reading the book of Matthew. He started reading the book of Matthew. He's not even completed reading the book of Matthew. He's just coming to church three months. And he's hardly even fasted for half a day. But he has prayed, asked the same request that you have been asking for how many years? 25 years. And you have fasted and prayed for how many days? 40 days. And he is hardly half a day fasted, not even read the Bible, complete Bible, not even completed reading Matthew, and God answers him. And you're thinking, God, 25 years you took to answer me. And just little Joe has prayed for a little time, and you've answered him in hardly any time. It's not fair. And God says, don't I have the right to do what I want to do, and it's my own will? Didn't I answer your prayer? Yes, God, you answered my prayer. Then I can't I do with little Joe what I want to do. Okay. So you and I cannot evaluate what God is doing from our own perspective. But when we see God doing it, we must celebrate with little Joe. Okay. <laughs> yes. We must celebrate whatever God does in his kingdom. Because in his kingdom, God blesses whom he chooses to less. He has mercy on who he chooses to have mercy. He extends grace to whom he chooses to extend grace. But what you and I need to do is we need to celebrate what God is doing. Okay. So if you see another brother or sister blessed and God is doing some awesome things in their lives, then we don't feel J. Okay. We don't feel J. Okay. Jealous. We we don't get angry, we don't complain, we don't uh, we don't murmur. But what do we do? We celebrate what the king is doing because he does as he pleases. No problem. The king is doing as he pleases, and that's part of his same kingdom. Okay, so it's your privilege to celebrate what the kingdom is doing in another person's life. When nobody to judge okay look at romans chapter 14 verse 4 what does it say it's in a slightly different context but paul is saying an amazing statement in romans chapter 14 verse 4 who are you to judge other servant to his own master he stands or fails false indeed he will be made to stand for god is able to make him stand romans 14 4. yes so here for example you're pastoring a city for 25 years and you have a congregation of only 50 people okay and here comes little joe who's just out of bible college fresh out of bible college anand or prince or um, sean or uh, nikhil or um, uh, lena sri radha just out of co bible college fresh start a church and then in just hardly one or two months or three months, I have a congregation of 100 people. 
and this pastor is getting J. He's saying, hey, 25 years, I've been in the same city, in the same area. I've been ministering here for 25 years, only 100 people. And, you know, Sarah has come or uh, Lena has come or, uh, you know, Anand has come and just hardly one year and the congregation is 100 people. And we think it's not right. And then we think that pastor must be up to some tricks. He's doing something. He's bribing people. He's just pulling them. No, we can't say that because that is the kingdom of God. You can't measure God according to your own thinking. God works in the way he pleases. And if you're truly part of the kingdom of God, you will rejoice with everything the king does. You will say, God, I have 50 people. Let me be faithful. I'm so glad that this young person has come and that 100 people in the same locality. That means there are 150 believers in this locality. We need to think like that. See, there are 150 people. And, you know, he might be so powerful. God, use him mightily so that everybody in this locality will come to his church. Not thinking that, you know, hey, it's unfair. It's not right. God, I'm not going to serve you anymore. I'm going to leave. And we'll be so angry with uh, God. But the thing... The thing is, the king does what he just pleases and what he thinks he wants to do. So he blesses who he wants to bless. And he knows when to come through in each of our lives. Okay. So what should your reaction be in the kingdom thinking? Wow, this is God working in this person's life. He's doing as he pleases. He just saw what is fit and he's doing whatever is fitting in his reason, in his thinking. So rather than measuring things in your own scale, celebrate what God is doing because he does not fit into any of our scales. He does not fit into any of our measurements. So we need to look at it from a kingdom perspective that the king is doing as he pleases and all of us just obey what he does and just go with what he does. Okay. But if we don't do that, then we will end up being jealous, backbiting, gossiping, and uh, like Saul running behind David and wasting our time and energy, not fulfilling God's plan and purpose, but all out to just, you know, destroy the kingdom of God. So it, it looks like we are, you know, destroying our own kingdom because we are not part of different kingdoms. We are part of the kingdom of God. And sadly, sometimes we end up doing that just like Saul. And you know what happened to Saul? Okay. Yes, you have a question, Prince. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, can we uh, take this parable like, uh, like how uh, uh, how uh, here God says one works at nine o'clock from nine, and some works at twelve, and some works at the last one hour? Can we use this uh, example uh, like parable uh, to apply it for the ministries? Like one person may be working from uh, doing ministry from. 10 years and one person maybe start and minister at one year and when they go to heaven God reward the same equally for their ministries can we also take this and apply see when we go context? what is a reward when we go to heaven good welcome good my good and faithful servant that is a reward that you have to hear well done good and faithful servant come enjoy my rest Okay, that is a place in the kingdom of heaven. That is a reward all of us will get. Now, what I'm saying is, for example, um, there was this missionary who went to a place and labored in that place and worked hard and toiled and prayed and cried out to God. And there was not even one convert in that place. But then when he, he left that place, he was very sad. He died later on. When other missionaries went, they found that there was one person in that same village who was born again but did not confess that he was born again and he went around sharing the gospel and slowly that whole town came or the whole village came to know the Lord. So who actually invested? Yes, that's what Paul says. Is No, Paul says who is Paul and who is Apollos? One digs the ground, one sows the seed, one waters and the other one harvest and all everything what everyone has done has actually paid and brought the harvest so somebody has already labored and i go there and i'm reaping the harvest doesn't mean that you know i've been more prayerful i've been uh, i'm more powerful i'm more anointed no there are people who are have come before and who have labored and have done the hard work and i need to acknowledge them 
that is what this verse is saying that you need to acknowledge them you need to speak about them need to find out about them and also thank god that they have you know dug the ground they have sown the seed they have watered and they have labored hard so that you can uh, receive yes who will get the reward like the person who saw the seed no, why or are looking for reward who gets the reward the harvest goes to whom he is the lord of the harvest god is the lord of the harvest it's not we who are bringing people into the kingdom we are just being me we are just being those mediums it is a holy spirit who convicts people of sin righteousness and judgment it's not us it's the holy spirit who works in them it's not how powerful i speak how anointed i speak how powerful how many days i fasted and prayed and gone and spoken the word how eloquent how skillful how i present the gospel all that is good we have to do that we have to be excellent in presenting the gospel and doing our work but ultimately it's god's power it is god's anointing that is flowing through us earthen vessels we are nothing it's god's power and anointing so god gets all the glory because the harvest goes to him he's the lord of the harvest yes sean uh there used to be this uh, pastor ma'am so he'll always he'll have this sunday school very small group of 10 to mm. uh, 12 people mm. so every day he used to come he used to tell bible stories to his people and he all he all used to wanted to preach in a big church to many people but this mm. is the job that he got to go teach these uh, kids in sunday school mm. he did that after a while he passed away Little did he know that one of, among them, one of them will be a great preacher, and that preacher is Billy Graham. Yes, that's so true. Thank you, Sean, for sharing that. Okay, we'll move on. The next one is a Kingdom Resolve, Luke chapter nine, verses fifty-seven to sixty-two. Can somebody read that? Luke chapter nine, verse fifty-seven to sixty-two. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him. Lord I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury, bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. but you go and preach the kingdom of god and another also said lord i will follow you but let me first go and bid them uh, farewell who are at my house but jesus said to him no one having uh, put his hand and to the plow and look looking back is fit for the kingdom of god thank you so here the challenge that jesus presents to these men does sound harsh right especially in the light of what jesus said for burying a father or saying goodbye to a family so if you want to follow the king then we uh, this is what he expects of us what does god expects of us when we want to follow him your assignment in the kingdom of god must supersede all your earthly objection uh, obligations and your earthly affections okay if you have to go back you know to do your family funeral that just keeping you away from pursuing the kingdom of god and better not go for the funeral just pursue the kingdom if your affection for your family is causing you to look back and not pursue uh, the kingdom goal what god has called you to do the kingdom plan and purposes it's taking you taking your attention away from god's plan and purpose for your life and from following the king then you better give up your affections for your family okay and then he says keep plowing without going home that means continue to work in the kingdom of god so what jesus is saying here does not mean you neglect your family responsibilities or neglect your responsibilities to the family okay because we see that elsewhere in the scripture we see that god uh, admonishes us to take care of our families we read about this in first timothy chapter 5 verse 8 um but yet god says you need to take care of your family you have a responsibility but we must maintain our resolve we must maintain our focus and what is our resolve and our focus is to serve the king and follow him and do whatever he is asking us to do we are not to be entangled with the affairs of this world that's what paul tells timothy paul tells timothy you are a soldier and a soldier 
does not get entangled in civilian affairs. He's always he's pleasing his commanding officer. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. So he's saying, you must please your commanding officer. And who's your commanding officer? Jesus. So soldier that does and does not get entangled in, in the civilian affairs, so also Jesus is saying in the kingdom thinking includes, you know, this level of resolve and commitment to the king and the cause of his kingdom that is unhindered by earthly responsibilities and affections. So sometimes when it comes between doing kingdom work and family, you know, which is more important? Kingdom work. But at the same time, we don't neglect our family responsibilities. The next thing about uh, kingdom thinking is handling rejection. Luke chapter 10, verse 11. Can somebody read that, please? Luke chapter 10, verse 11. The very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. Yes, yeah, so Jesus is saying that, you know, when you go and preach and teach the gospel, not everybody is going to welcome you. And not everybody is going to be happy. There are going to be persecutions. There are people who reject your message. People who are not interested, you know. But this must not decrease your commitment for the kingdom. This must not hinder you or, you know, make you feel sad or say, hey, I'm not a good preacher. I'm not a good teacher. When I go and preach and teach, nobody's listening to me. Nobody's willing to accept. You know, nobody's turning away uh, to the truth. So I'm not going to preach or teach. Okay. We will face rejection. But, you know, we know it's not because there is something wrong with the gospel. Okay. There's not no, there's nothing wrong with the kingdom that we are representing, but it's simply that men prefer darkness to light. John chapter 3 verse nothing. So there's nothing wrong in the gospel message. There's nothing wrong about what Jesus has done. There's nothing wrong with the kingdom that we represent. Okay, but it is just simply that men prefer darkness to light. Okay, so in the kingdom thinking, when we face rejection, uh, you need to know that you have been brought, you know, you have uh, brought the kingdom of God to these people. They have rejected it. And now you move on, but you continue to advance the kingdom of God amongst other people. That should not hinder you or deter you or, uh, you know, disappoint you or uh, dampen your spirits. But you just continue to preach and teach and God will continue to work in their lives okay then the last one is the eye of a needle can somebody read mark chapter 10 verses 17 to 31 please mark 10 17 to 31 now as he was going out on the road one came running knelt before him and asked him good teacher <clears throat> what shall i do that i may inherit eternal life so jesus said to him why do you call me good no one is good but one that is god you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witnesses, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he, he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in, in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his work. But Jesus answered again, again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who would trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to him, See, he have left all and followed you. Uh, so, so Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father and mother or wife or children or land for my sake and the, for the gospel 
who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and land, with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. How many who are first will be, uh, but many, uh, the last will be uh, first. Okay. Amen. Okay, thank you. We'll stop here. We'll I'll explain this uh, passage next week. Uh, Jackin says, Jesus wants us to love everyone. To him, every soul is precious. He loves and gives generously. My mind should not be ma narrow or selfish, but instead be selfless and overflow with love of God because I've received so much. So she's talking about this in the context of the parable. Any questions anyone has? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, please think kingdom thinking, all that we have learned, put it into practice and live kingdom lifestyles and kingdom culture. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for joining today's class and I'll see you next week. Have a blessed week. Thank you. Thank you.